So is it true? Is it true that you are you are part of the Huang dynasty? You're his related to him. He's in the family tree. It is. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Today I have with me Nang. He is a tech YouTuber, former hedge fund software engineer, recent startup founder, and also YC Acceptee. So he just got into Y Combinator. So I'd like to have him on the podcast today. We're going to talk about a bunch of stuff and I hope you guys enjoy. So what's up, Nang? How's it going? It's going good. Thanks for all that and uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Of course, of course. I really want to start with YouTube, man, because you, I think I checked right before this episode and you have 160,000 subscribers, which I mean, in the, in the grand scheme of YouTube may not be a lot, but I think 160,000 people following you is, is a big number, no matter what the platform, right? Mm -hmm. So why don't you just talk about like YouTube, how you started, how it's evolved over time and yeah, how you like all that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say that at the core of it, I'm not too traditional on the YouTube stuff because I didn't really care about any subscribers at the time or like throughout the entire thing. I was just doing it because I thought it was fun. Um, I started off um, making, or this was 12 years ago, I made videos about how to do like weird or like at that time, what I thought was really cool science project. It's like the fucking... Um, is a baking soda in the yeah. Pepsi the volcano? Yeah, stuff like that. Like yeah, all those um, things. Twelve years ago, and then I made videos about that. And then after that, I really liked FIFA, so I made FIFA videos. And then after a while, I liked doing that, just entertaining people, and also just seeing um, like myself try to be like creative on camera. And then after a while, I realized that I did not like FIFA that much, but I did really like coding. So then I made. A lot of videos about coding and then that took off in an unexpected way interesting yeah i i mean kind of similar like i started making tech videos and they kind of just blow up so clearly yeah. there's a need for it out there on the internet and people enjoy seeing that software engineering coding related content yeah so you pretty much had it all like you went to carnegie mellon yeah. One of the number, I think it's tied for first in terms of computer science programs in the United States. I think so. Yeah. With, with Stanford. I think CMU <laughs> and Stanford are number one for computer science. So yeah. you pretty much had it all. You went to CMU for computer science. You graduated. You started working at a hedge fund in New York City, making mm -hmm. like 300K a year. And yeah. what happened? Like a couple months ago, you said, you know what? I've had enough of this. You quit. And now you're doing your own startup. Yeah, so I, I did just quit my job in a quant firm uh, three months ago. And I think that it was because I did not want to do it since the beginning. Um, I think that it was, it was part of like my goal of trying to be like a startup founder and trying to like innovate in, in the world. And so the entire time, my mind was that I wasn't going to stay there forever. And it was kind of a stepping stone. So then it just made sense for me to leave because... Um, I kind of had that in mind from the beginning. I guess there's another factor to that is that I also did not like the job too much. I think that, like, I studied so hard at CMU and I, I really like coding and I didn't, I felt like I didn't want that to be put towards just making other people richer. I think at the core, that's what the business model is for these quant firms. And I think that there's a lot better things that I and other people can do with what they like to do if it's coding or something else I, I mean there's, there's a fair point to that but I want to really dive deep on your mentality and your mindset because mm -hmm. going through college most people's goal is get that super high paying job right out of school graduate move to like a big city start making that bread and then have fun and you mm -hmm. pretty much had all of those things but it still wasn't enough at the end of the day so can you talk a little bit like what was it like being at CMU, getting that job, moving to New York, doing all the things, mm -hmm. and then deliberately deciding, okay, now is the time for me to step back and actually do the thing that I want to do? Hmm. Yeah, I think I'll start with CMU. Um, at CMU, I was definitely um, on the, the same job grind as everyone else. Um, I think that um, I actually... I liked doing the competitive programming stuff, 
So that was just like very, very fortunate for the coding stuff that that's what they looked for. And then, um, yeah, I think that at the core of it, um, I think my fun was just not, I, I do love partying. I do like all that, that stuff, but I think that it's like a side thing. Like my fun is actually making stuff. Like I think that it's just, if I had all the time in the world, I would spend most of my time doing that. Um, so, so that's what I would do. Like at CMU, I was just making projects on the side and then making YouTube videos about it because um, I wanted other people to see that coding is um, pretty cool. Like what I thought, it's a bit corny, but that's what I was thinking and still think. And then my decision to leave, I would say that's, um, yeah, having it all, it is having it all for, for most people. For, but for me, I just, I didn't feel like I was happy just doing that for the rest of my life. I think that's the conclusion I came to. Yeah. And as soon as I realized that, um, I kind of had an understanding of that for a long time, but as soon as I realized that, it was time to leave. Yeah, yeah it, it's interesting because when you come at it from a place of lack of abundance, like you're in college, you don't have the internship, you don't have the job offer, mm -hmm. there's an immense amount of pressure on you to get to get that goal. But then once you have it, your expectations reset. Yes. yes. Right? And then you're back kind of almost at square one in a sense because guess what? You got the thing that you wanted, but now it's like, okay, what's next? Am I just going to continue doing this? Am I just going to grind for that next promotion? Mm -hmm. And then if I get that next promotion, like what happens next? Do I just go for the next promotion, the next one? Like when does this thing end? And is this going to be the rest of my life? Yeah. And it's a really weird thing to kind of cope with that decision matrix. It's like, what do I even do right now? Yeah. So, so what you mentioned is like exactly how I felt as well. It's like, I didn't know if I would like this lifestyle. And I think that in order for me to realize that I had to like, um, kind of achieve that mm -hmm. job and that lifestyle to know that I didn't like it. Um, like my friend was telling me that, it's almost like you, it's a mountain and you're going to the top of the mountain to realize that you didn't want to be there in the first place. But the only way you can know that is by going to the top of the mountain first or like getting to the top of the mountain. So I think that was me for the quant job. It's like yeah. I, I worked hard for it. I got it. And I realized that it's not really what I ever wanted. Yeah. And you, by the way, you, you wanted to get out so badly that you were willing to pay back some of your signing bonus, right? <laughs> Yes. Um, in the contract, you had to stay for two years to keep your signing bonus. Um, and then I just, mm -hmm. I felt like any amount of money, like time is worth more than money. So I would rather have my time than like yeah. keep X amount of money. Yeah. So can you talk about like the compensation structure at all? Like, like, the, cause there's like a mm -hmm. signing, are you allowed to? Um, probably. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I so like, for people who aren't familiar, yeah. when you join yeah. at like, uh, you, you can talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when you join at these quant firms, I would say the, the structure is that there's always a signing bonus, mm -hmm. a yearly signing, a yearly a yearly salary and a end of year bonus. So my breakdown was, I'll just talk in general, maybe like around 120 for the signing, uh, per, and then like around 170 for the yearly yeah. salary and then around 90 for the year end. And it was a lot of money. Like, yeah. I was like mind blown by this kind of money. My parents did not, also did not believe. They were like yeah. thinking that I signed up for a scam. And I thought that too, like to be honest. And then when I actually saw it, it hit my bank account, I was like, this is actually crazy. Um, it's for me, I felt from going from a college student that was like living in a, in a flex three bedroom, it was like changed my life. Yeah, I think yeah. that's something that people don't comprehend until it actually happens to you. Like you hear about these crazy salaries, maybe online or TikTok, Instagram, whatever you see. Oh, I made like 200, 300K right out of school. You're like, oh, that's, that's fake, right? And you look in the comments of these videos and it's like, oh no, this guy's lying. Like he's, he's, he's capping, like that's not real. Yeah. But like similar position for me, you know, when I joined, I, it's like $220,000. That's a lot of money for somebody who's 22 years old. Definitely. Like, there's no if, and, or buts about it. it. That's a ton of money. 
And you're like, my parents, when I told them similar, they're like, I don't believe you. Like, how is that real? <laughs> like, yeah. how do they even pay this much money to these, to, to like these kids, essentially? Like, how is that possible? Mm -hmm. But you don't realize that it just, like, it's actually real and it can literally change your life. Yeah. yeah. But even still, you're like, you know what? It's not for me. I want to do this own thing and pursue my dream. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So why don't we talk about that a little bit? Like, what are you doing now? What's the startup that you're working on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So right now I'm working on a startup called Pair AI. It's an AI open source code editor. And I miss, I can keep going on that if you want me to. Yeah. And you recently yeah. got accepted to Y Combinator, which is huge. Yeah. We were grinding for funding. It was not looking good. Like we would go to these investors and it would be it would be a really tough sell and we finally got funding um which is good we also launched so everybody can try out the code editor uh, i'm very proud of it it's, it's helped me um develop on pair ai a lot it's at trypair.ai cool so that's yeah. kind of meta like you're using pair ai to build pair ai exactly yeah, that's like super trippy actually <laughs> like, it's very circular yeah and it only gets better and better as it uh keeps going on so it's exciting. Yeah. yeah. And so let's dive into a little bit more. Like it's an open source, it's an open source AI code editor, right? Mm -hmm. right? So what does that help people achieve and like, why should they use it? Okay. Yeah. So I think the core of this is that AI is changing how people code. Um, people, a lot of the times right now just use ChatGPT to ask them, ask it, how do I make a button? And it can help you do that just fine. But I think there's a missing layer, which is knowledge of the code base that you're in. Um, it's like equivalent to asking ChatGPT a question about Christopher Columbus, and it'll know because it's public, but you can't ask it about your dad's favorite food because it has no idea anything about your dad. So the same thing with the code. It's like, you can ask it about the button, but you can't ask it, how do I make it a button in my code base? And that's what Pair AI does. It has full knowledge of your code base also, and it also reduces all the friction of working with AI. Yeah. And so I think some people know your, your co-founder probably, right? You guys are both YouTubers in the, in the tech space. So who, who, you're working with Pan, right? Yeah. My co-founder's name is Frying Pan and he's a lot bigger than me. Like I think. Well, he's 6'5", right? <laughs> <laughs> that too. Yes. Yeah, yeah, he's 6'5". He's five. physically yeah. super tall. Um, yeah. And yeah, he's 6'5". He's, he's honestly goaded. Um, great guy. And, and yeah, he, we we're both working really hard on this. We've moved in together in this uh, really nice apartments. And yeah, I don't know if you guys can tell, but this is like kind of like a shitty building. Like, I'm not gonna <laughs> lie, it's like pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's um, we're moving out, so so we're, yeah, we're, yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. So you you get accepted to Y Combinator. Yeah, and they're making. Are you you're just moving to San Francisco, right? It's mandatory. Uh, it's kind of both okay. sides. We definitely think that building a code editor in SF is better than New York. And then also they um, force us to go to SF. Okay. So you move out literally next week or yeah. like in a week yeah. and a half? Yeah, like um, eight days. Yeah. Away. It's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. When we just heard the news like less than like around a week ago. So we have to um, do a lot of moving in the meantime. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's huge, dude. Congrats. Like I'm, I'm pumped for you. Like, <laughs> so you. some context, like I literally just met Nang like, a month ago and then he's like oh yeah by the way like i just got accepted to y combinator like i'm moving to sf i'm like yeah. oh sh like we need to get this podcast out like <laughs> right now because like i need to get it for the people right yeah no i was i was really glad to meet ben not to glaze but dude's this is one of the best people in new york that i've met and i'm leaving so soon so that's a bit i sad. appreciate that i but, appreciate that but yeah we'll we'll meet up in sf for no sure worries. Yeah. yeah i think so why don't you talk a little bit about like how did you meet pan and then how did you guys mutually come to the decision that because he also left his job recently yep so how yep. did you guys come to that mutual decision together like all right let's go all in on this thing and like that's it like let's just do it <laughs> yeah so the story between me and pan is that around three four years ago um when we were both starting out on youtube we were we did not have a lot of subscribers we just saw each other's videos because we were in the same niche and we messaged each other and we just said, hey, like you're doing, you're, we're both um, working on this. Let's like keep going on this. We didn't have much to talk about because we're, we weren't like super into the YouTube stuff starting out, but we were pretty much had an agreement of when we have a reason to talk, like let's talk in the future. 
And fast forward uh, three, four years, we went hard on YouTube. We both um, made a lot more videos and it just made sense for us to meet up. So we got dinner in New York and I think just, we just clicked. Like right now we're best friends and um, yeah, he's great. I think our values are just like the same pretty much. And in terms of um, making the decision to go all in on this, it, it was not easy. It took like a year of talking about it. Yeah. Um, I was pretty much, a lot of it was me trying to um, convince him to do it with me. Um, Pan, Pan is like really choosy with like people he works with, I would say. So I had to like keep, keep um, telling him that this is like the right thing to do. And um, Pan did, kept his job until we got funding. And then since we got funny now, he has quit his job. That's crazy. And what was that like, actually, the process of applying to all these funds and, and trying to talk with investors to pitch your product? What was that like? Yeah, I think that it was half connections based. So you would have to talk to your friend that d does founder stuff and he knows someone like an angel investor. And those did not pan out super well. And the other one is like application based. And it's these incubators exactly like um, Parex, YC, the old fellowship um, founders fund. And those ones is you don't need any real connections. These are all like public on the internet and you apply to them. And, and yeah, they like the one we went with was the application based one, which is YC. Yeah. Interesting. And when you, when you got like, how is that decision making work? Like, is it you apply and then you get the decision in a week, a month, or what is it like? Yeah, it's a crazy process because it's so short. You apply, they have a 15 minute call with you. And after that 15 minute call within a, like the next day, they called us back and they just told us that we're in. So it was super fast. They yeah. just gauge you, like they grill you for 15 minutes and they, they're on to the next person and the next day, they, they, they grilled us for like about five more minutes before telling us that um, we got the funding. Yeah. Interesting. So they're like, yo, we need five more minutes. <laughs> like, <to grind." laughs> like, yo, we had yeah. like two questions. Like, can we ask them really quick? Is that how it worked? Literally, that's how it worked. Okay, wow. Like, yeah, they asked us um, how we work together. And, like, and you said you like, you guys live together, right? Obviously. Yeah. These are big things that they care about yeah. for the co-founder stuff. So we're just like, yeah, we, we live together. We have, um, we make decisions together. Uh, we trust each other. If like we have disputes, like honestly, the best path is forward. We have this thing called, um, I guess, trust, but move forward. Pretty much. We don't have to agree on everything. Maybe one person is very opinionated or maybe we're both opinionated, but there's times where you just have to trust the other person and just make a decision to move forward. And that's what we've been doing. It's been, it's been really good. And so why see like that? Yeah. So I guess something to like try to help other people. Like if you're, if you know somebody out there, they're trying to make their own startup, what would be your general advice from like idea conception? Cause that's like the hardest part, right? Is how do I find an idea? And I think that's where most people struggle. That's like the biggest sticking point. Cause a lot of people out there, they want to make their own company, but they mm -hmm. don't know where to start. And maybe they do have friends. Maybe they do have people that they can work with on this idea together. But where they struggle is like the, the hardest part is finding that idea. So how did you guys find your idea if you're allowed to talk about it? <laughs> and then yeah, no, definitely. how did you make that decision? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's at a core of it. When you start a company, you have to have some sort of insight or unfair advantage in whatever you're making. Because if you don't have that, then you're just like anyone else. And you're probably not making something that people would actually want or pay for. So the biggest thing is that, you know, everything can be your advantage. Like, let's say even if you're playing video games 24-7, everybody is like, oh, video games are for lazy people or something like that. Like, that can be your advantage because you just know so much about this niche. And then you would have some sort of insight into a problem that people have within this niche. Um, and in terms of... Me and Pan, um, I liked, well, I guess, yeah. The first thing we did, we, we pivoted ideas actually. The first one we did was influencer marketing. It's because we had insight into being YouTubers and the process for getting sponsorships is pretty annoying. Like, it's like, um, 
you have to either go through an agency that takes a lot of cut of it, and also you don't know like which brands would be down to do sponsorships for you. So it's pretty much our first idea was a influencer sponsorship marketplace where there's brands that post jobs and then influencers that can take up these jobs and has analytics for these companies. Um, and I think that's a great idea. If somebody's watching, they, they yeah. should make it. Like, it'd be great. Um, and what yeah. caused you to pivot off of that? <clears throat> yeah, I think that it's because our unfair advantage was not really that strong. Like we, at the core of it, are tech YouTubers. And so us in the influencer space, we probably need like, I don't know. Generic um, marketing as opposed to like the tech niche. Yeah, exactly. Because like, I feel like most influencers who get sponsorships are primarily like beauty for mm -hmm. like women, for example. That's a huge one. Yeah. Food or like, I know home decor, like, but these are very yeah. general niches, right? That they span like the general population. Whereas tech, I feel like is a bit more, it's more service-based. It's more like sequestered. It's smaller, more niche. So I feel like maybe the insight that you guys had wouldn't be as applicable to other more broader domains. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The right person to do that would be like, uh, I don't know, a version of PewDiePie or something. <laughs> like some yeah, maybe. Um, I think I think actually I want to circle back to something, which is uh -huh. how we just did there. It's like when these when these YC guys are on the call with you, they're able to figure out whether it's viable or not in like 15 minutes, which is yeah. pretty, pretty insane. Because most people I think out there, like they deliberate over these things for hours, days, weeks, months, mm -hmm. potentially even years. <laughs> and then these guys hop on a call with you 15 minutes later, they're pretty much they have 90 percent of an idea like let's invest, let's not. Yeah, I think one thing to say about that is that YC is actually less, they're investing less in your idea, but investing in like the founder. Yeah. Like I've heard of other founders in the end of their interview, they're just like, this idea is not good, but we think that you guys are good founders. So are you willing to just do this other idea? And then if they say yes, they get funded for another idea. And so there, there's that too. But your point of them knowing is, is like, actually crazy yeah yeah like if you if you're talking with somebody who's actually competent on the domain that you're discussing yeah they're going to be able to suss you out in a very short amount of time mm -hmm. yeah i've talked to people before and i'm like this guy has no clue what he's talking about and you know in the first <laughs> like 30 seconds right you can just read somebody like that i think that's very yeah. critical yeah yeah when you get deep into any field i feel like that's yeah it, it probably just you can like you're deep in coding obviously so yeah somebody's just like i don't know doesn't know the the acronym or something like html and just or like http doesn't know it then obviously it's gonna be yeah lacking. but yeah it's just like something that you just have or you don't really i see so it's, yeah. it's like it's cool that i mean obviously both you and pan you know you worked at pretty reputable companies mm -hmm. you know so it, there's a pretty much a a decent buy-in from that perspective, but I think it's it's definitely a testament to you guys in general that you got in, like clearly. Hey, yeah. thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> when you were at CMU, mm -hmm. what was that like? Would you would you recommend it to people? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, so I have mixed feelings about CMU. It is definitely, I would call it a sweat school. Like you're there to be sweating on your work. And there's fun parts to it, but I would say that it's only really worth it if you like what you're doing. And it's it's honestly crazy to me how the school system expects you to like declare a major in the like when you're what, 16? When you're 18? Bro, it's 16. I don't know what age you went <laughs> through college, my guy, but <laughs> I, I I started at 18. Yeah, like right. normal. Not like not everybody's not Michael like, Kicking out here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. But um either way, like for me, I already knew that I loved coding at the point where I was deciding to go to CMU. And I would say that only if you really like it will it be worth it. And I think that there's a lot of people that do like it at CMU and they just have a great time. They thrive. People that aren't really as into it, like it feels like work to them. They actually just, um, it's like probably a very depressing place. I think it's interesting that you use the term like sweat school. Mm-hmm. Because I would say what you're doing now is pretty sweaty. Like your work-life balance now. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little <laughs> bit. Because I think people, 
I did a quick Q and A on Instagram. I'll probably have to grab my phone to like do a, check out all the questions that I received. But I saw one of them, and it was like, can he talk about the reality of working on a startup and what that work life balance is like? Okay, yeah, I think people really want to know this. Yeah, um, I have a lot to say about it. There is really no work life balance. Like, um, I can walk you guys through my day. It would just be I wake up, I go to my computer, I start working on Pear, maybe some YouTube. I go downstairs, Sweet Green is right next door, so I use Sweet Green. It's like 20, 30 minutes. I come back, I go back to my desk, I work until seven, uh, usually stream a bit. Um, I do, I, co I code working on Pear AI because it's open source and it's a good time. And I get dinner. I usually get delivery or something downstairs, like half an hour, and I come back. Maybe I'll do a, a workout um, sometime in the nights until 12. And yeah, I've been working since then. And then me and Pan watch some TV show for maybe an hour from like 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. And then we go to sleep and we do that every day. I, on a normal day, I see zero people except for Pan. Yeah. So. That's actually crazy that you see literally zero humans aside from your roommate. Yeah. It was actually the same thing when I was working at the quant firm. Um, it I was, mean, did you go in the office? Yeah. I mean, I could, but I didn't. It's just work from home was nicer. And yeah, because I was doing the nine to five. And then after that, I would go you know, downstairs, get food upstairs, and then do YouTube until 1 a.m. And then just repeat uh, on a Monday through Thursday. Yeah. And then Friday, Saturday at that time, I was still enjoying like partying. I would party super hard and like anywhere in New York. <laughs> and it was like a really good time and it's like my relaxed time. But now it's definitely like Saturdays and Sundays is pretty much spent on pair as well. Yeah. I, I think that's interesting because the assumption that most people make when they say, oh, I'm a, I'm a remote employee or they hear somebody say I'm a remote employee is that it's, oh, you, you basically do zero work. But when <laughs> yeah. you work at a company that is rigorous and has extremely intelligent coworkers, like you know, a hedge fund or a big tech company, or especially one of the more prestigious ones that are known for having that worse work life balance, you're working basically 24 seven because you're constantly getting pings. Yeah. It's very hard to detach from that. Mm -hmm. So I find actually a similar situation. Whenever I work from home, I'm like glued to the desk. I, I do not move at all. Yeah. But yeah. in contrast, when I go to the office, I'm walking around, you know, I'm, I'm physically moving, getting my body to the office. So there's some transitional period there mm -hmm. so there's an automatic break just from that and then also going home mm -hmm. just like that block of time that you're not working yeah but also when you're in the office you're like walking around you, you know you're talking to people it maybe isn't as pure focus work as you would be if you're at home and i think that's the distinction is when you're at home working remotely it's basically 24 7 on like you're pure focus work all the time well can you, do you not walk around? <laughs> like, um, like, bro, I live in a studio apartment. I don't know oh, what kind of walking you think I'm going to be doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bro thinks yeah. I'm walking around the studio. Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I can do a lap. Like it's over in like 10 seconds, but yeah, I see. Yeah. It would be like a whole dedicated thing where you go outside and walk like 15 minutes if you were. To yeah. Walk. I mean, in SF, when I was, when I was living in San Francisco, I would do that. Oh, yeah. Um, but my actual apartment itself felt like a prison almost because it had like no yeah. sunlight. So I would just be in like this and I had no furniture. I had no furniture, no sunlight. And I just had my desk in this room that was like kind of shrouded in darkness. Yeah. And I was just there. And I remember sometimes I would step outside like when I was really in like the throes of like a an intense work life balance sprint or like something where I just really had to p pound the, the code out. I would step outside after having coded like all day and like the sun would hit my eyes and I literally would, would be like, oh, I could, like a vampire, like, like melting in the sunlight. Yeah. Do you, feel, you feel something similar? <laughs> well, I mean, you were in the trenches, it sounds like, but I, I care. Yeah. Like, um, I think that's, I always put my well being. I, I mean, I know you do too. Like you go to the gym and, and Ben's way fitter than me. I would say though, like for this stuff, whatever you're doing in the trenches, I would not let myself get to the point. Like, like because I am thinking that if I am overall happier, my work will be better. And so I like pamper myself almost with the with like nice windows and like I'll order milk tea or something like that. Just like, 
make myself happier while I'm working. So I don't really, <laughs> I don't get to that point. Yeah. So, I mean, I, 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 w I do parent for myself too. I think yeah. self-care is really important, yeah. especially when you're working so hard and mm -hmm. you're so intense in your work, having that level of self-care to where you're able to combat the entropy that happens when you're like just deteriorating, working so intensely on this thing. Like you need to be engaged in intense self-care yeah. to the point, like going to the gym, doing cardio, going outside for little walks, whatever, eating healthy food, maybe cooking. Yeah. These things, these activities, they take time. Yeah. And so as a result, you have to compromise. Like you see the actual reality is that you may actually, in fact, see zero humans for, or you may talk to minimal people for the majority of your week. And that's just the reality of it because you have to do that. Like that's literally what it is yeah yeah i would agree um pretty much when i'm doing this stuff and also especially now because pan is like i kind of made him leave his cushy job because if he wasn't doing this he he like <laughs> loves the cushy job yeah yeah, um, yeah. Like, who doesn't right and so he kind of gave that up for me so i feel almost like in debt. obligation obligation that's yeah. that's what i'm i feel um so yeah like i when i do this i already I'm signing up to give up or like sacrifice a normal life. Um, sacrifice. Yeah, it is 100% a sacrifice. For a time, I was trying to do, you know, like still trying to get dinner every day with my friends and, and stuff like that. And it just is not, it's not possible. Like you just have to sacrifice to make things work. And yeah, that's, uh, that's how it is right now. Yeah, I think that's a common theme is, is sacrifice. Mm -hmm, definitely so what is what does that word mean to you like dissect that a bit because it sounds like most of your life has been sacrifice and i think i resonate with that message too mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think like um hmm. and by the way this is a question that a lot of people have they're like i get questions like hey ben how are you justifying this in your head this sacrifice that you talk about yeah yeah so how do you have like how do you justify it? Okay, um, yeah, I think this comes down to like a core belief that I have is that the world disproportionately rewards exceptional people, right? So I think I'm not thinking about I don't know, or I guess what I am thinking about when I'm LeBron sacrificing. James. <laughs> LeBron James is is exceptional. You're getting <laughs> disproportionately rewarded, <laughs> that's for sure. But I'll say that. When I think about sacrifice, it's it's for a a cause, right? It's for something. I'm not just sacrificing just because of, of nothing. Like I want to be exceptional. That's what the sacrifice is for. Um, for me, it's like yeah, the world disproportionately uh, rewards exceptional people, and so I have two options. I have to not sacrifice anything, and I can't buy my mom a nice house, or I do sacrifice stuff, and I can have a chance, or at least I think I probably can get to a point where I can buy, buy my mom a super nice house. And when I put it like that, it just makes total sense for me to try to be exceptional and sacrifice, uh, like getting dinner with my friends Monday through Thursday. <laughs> I like how you went from like, yeah, like this is hardcore sacrifice. Like talk to zero people. You're like, I, actually Monday through Thursday. Like that's, that's the window that I'm willing to. <laughs> no, no, it, it's every day. Um, every day. Yeah. I mean, for like, the most part. yeah, there's, there's also the thing of like sustainability, right? Like I am not super dramatic slash hardcore. I'm not like, I have to lock myself in. I think that most CS kids are like that, actually. They're like lead coding. They, and they, they like to think they're like that. That especially, you can trick yourself into thinking anything, right? I could tell the camera I'm like that too, and suddenly I am like that too. But like the reality is that, yeah, I'm like super locked in, but I also need to make it sustainable. Like. All, everything I do is for the long term. Like I have to be able to do this for the next decade. So I can, do, I can squeeze out much more productivity in the next year if I just do blackout curtains every day, don't see anyone. But because I need to be happy, um, on Saturday mornings, we host pickleball in New York City and we all come or get together and play pickleball for like two hours. I get to see my friends. And then on Sunday, we probably do like a brunch and then I go back to work after that. But there's like two things per week that is social. I don't know if that counts as not being locked in, but there's that.
Yeah, I think everybody has their own social meter and how much interaction they need to feel that level of pamper or just yeah. that balance. Mm -hmm. And for some yeah. people, like they don't need as much as others. Um, definitely, yeah. Yeah, I've definitely gone through periods where it was almost no social interaction. I think COVID was a big, big one. When I was in college, like my junior sophomore junior year like that was when it was i learned i'm actually very grateful for it because i learned how to to lock myself away yeah and deprive myself of that and learn to do like learn to live with it yeah, yeah. i saw you were going through like an extreme lock-in when you were doing that kind of stuff i don't know if you correct me if i'm wrong but was that sustainable um so I, I think there were two periods. There was one like my junior year when I didn't have an internship. Literally, I got an internship offer like May 20 something, mm -hmm. like right before summer started. I didn't have one before then. Actually, I did. I had one, but I reneged on it because I didn't want to work <laughs> at that company. <laughs> but I was like, I basically treated it as like, I cannot do this. I cannot work for these people. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't like fully committed to just like destroying my life or sacrificing it away. Mm -hmm. But my senior year, that was when it was really life or death because I was like, I do not want to return to this company. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So I think when you're confronted with a clear decision between almost to the level of existential crisis, then it's very easy to flip that switch. That was the first time yeah. for me that I was able to actually fully flip that switch. Mm -hmm. I deleted every single social media off my phone, like nothing. So whenever you do that instinctual whip out your phone, like try to sc scroll through some app, I didn't even have that. And I... So every time I did that, I was like, I just threw my phone away because it, it, nothing existed for me to just waste my time with. Yeah, I feel like probably going through that just helped you afterwards just be a more productive person. Yeah, absolutely. I, I almost actually felt like Saitama in that, like, yeah. that yeah. month. It was like it unlocked my limiter. Like, you mm -hmm. know, the concept of a limiter in one punch, how he just like he has no limiter, right? He just punches. <laughs> mm -hmm. right? That's it. I, yeah. I almost felt like it unlocked a, cer a certain level of that in myself mm -hmm. yeah so i yeah. mean it was for a very clear use case and i only did it for like a month so and it was yeah. absolutely it was batshit like i would not do that degree of intensity again probably mm -hmm. yeah makes sense so i think circling back to you it sounds like you talked about buying your your mom a house like would you say that the sacrifice is familial obligation um, yeah, I would say that's, I think, hmm, yeah, there's two things that drive, that drive me is that one is I just have a hard on for innovation. I think, Whoa. am I allowed to say that? <laughs> yeah, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Like that's how I would put it. It's like, yeah, I love innovation. Like for some reason, it's just cool to me. Just building shit. Yeah. Building yeah. shit that has never existed before. I think that is just like super cool to me. And that's like what I want to do. It's like. I can, I can be born, I can work for a big company and like do things that's, maybe it is a bit innovative, but it won't be like crazy innovative. And then when I die, it's just like, what is my net innovation contribution is like very minimal. But if I do like my own thing and try to innovate, um, like I would look up to Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, Jensen Huang, Elon Musk, and like every tech pro pretty much. But yeah, like, that is one factor, the innovation parts. And then the next part is buying my parents super nice things. <laughs> yeah. Bro just wants to spoil and pamper his parents. So <laughs> well, I'm going to come doesn't? back to the Jensen Huang thing in a second. But what up? <laughs> so let me get this straight. You wanted to be super innovative. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. So you come up with an AI code editor whose main competitor right now just got $60 million in funding. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I mean, so, let's talk about that a little. I'm not, not to put you on blast or anything, but. Hold up. Let's let's discuss this. No, I think everything should be criticized, like for sure. It's like we have another competitor. Then suddenly, then I guess one angle is like, then you're not innovating because there's another person doing this, right? Um, which is fair. But I think that what we're doing is innovative because we are trying to change the way that coding is done. Like you won't ever, I think that you won't ever have to write a line of Python ever again in the future. The main coding language will be English. And I think that is the future. So... That's pretty innovative to me. In terms of competition, I think anything worth doing should have competition. So I think that it's great. And 
for all this stuff, like I actually don't have too much of a personal like stake. I guess maybe this is a flaw of mine, but I don't like, I just want the best AI code editor to exist in the world because I existed. It doesn't have to be me. It doesn't yeah. have to be yeah, yeah, yeah. pair AI is number one. Of course, that'd be great. And for Pan, I think Pan makes me want that more. But I think that because I give Cursor a open source competitor or not any um, competitor, a open source competitor, that will push them to also make a better product. And we will also make a better product. One of them will probably win. But at the high level, there will be a better code editor in the world. Yeah, I think there's a really nuanced point there. And I obviously I bring that up as like kind of a meme, yeah. but I think there is a nuanced point there, which is competition is good and competition competition leads to innovation. Exactly. Because yeah. when two people like or two entities are basically matched up against each other, they're forced to push each other. Like put they're forced to push each other, like the Soviet Union in the USA back in the sixties <laughs> for the like the race to the moon, for example. Like that's a very clear one. Yeah. Yeah. So you're exactly. kind of that's like you right now, Sputnik or whatever the the c comparison would be versus <laughs> uh, versus USA. cursor. <laughs> I, right? I would want to be USA. On okay, that. yeah, yeah USA. <laughs> nah, he's he's trying to get to the moon. But I, I, for something, before I come to the Jensen Wong thing, yeah, I think people don't understand what the use case is for an open source AI code editor, <clears> which is people don't realize this, but when you work at a big company or a big tech company specifically, all of the code that you work on is proprietary and confidential. So you're not allowed to share it with anybody. Mm -hmm. That's why usually when you watch like these day in the life type videos and people are showcasing their software engineering job, they usually never show the code at all. It's because they're literally not allowed to. People are in the comments like, oh, you usually do more coding than this. It's like, mm -hmm. actually, bro, like I just can't show the code. Yeah. And so relating off of that, when you work at a big tech company or really any company that has proprietary and confidential code, you can't use chat GPT or any of these other AI agents, large language models, because you're essentially copy pasting your code, which is confidential into the, the large language model. So it's a breach of your contract. So you're not allowed to use that. So this is where pair AI comes in cursor come in these open source AI code editors. Since they're open source, the idea is that these private companies will then allow their employees to use them mm -hmm. for their development because it's, yeah. So basically like code editors have two different use cases, mm -hmm. personal use, right? Yep. Like individual use and then enterprise <clears throat> use, which is like at a big tech company or just any company, the employees using that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say that's most of our big competitors. You mentioned cursor there not open source. Yeah. So that's one thing that we have going for us as a differentiator. I think yeah. we'll probably pay out long-term hopefully, but yeah, I also just think open source is the future. Um, I've been thinking that for a while and I contributed to open source like a long time ago. So that's why it's another unfair advantage thing that we were talking about before. Like why should we make PRI? Yeah, why are we the best people to make PRI? Yeah, that, that's interesting. I actually, I've never done anything open source. Yeah, no worries. Most I, people I don't. Think, yeah. I think open source is kind of a meme. Mm -hmm. I, I like GitHub in general. I like. I don't really use. You know how people you look at their their profile, they're flexing. They're like, "Oh, look at my GitHub <laughs> profile! Like, I have infinite forks, infinite repos. Look at all the green squigglies on like the showing the frequency of commits I have." I'm like, this is kind of a meme, like because I feel most people they don't work in an open source environment because. Maybe they're trying to make money mm. off of what they're doing or the code is, again, confidential and proprietary. So why would you then put it on a public GitHub repo or you're just working directly local from your machine, right? Using exactly. some source control, yeah. I would say for most things, open source is not that good because it just doesn't make sense, like you said. And I think there's a few things that are that's really good. Um, for one is a code editor because the users are developers. So developers know what they want, they're using the product and then can contribute to the code editor that they're using to make it better. And yeah. that's why code editor is one example. And then there's another um, example about like file downloading. I think there's two big companies, I forgot the names, but it's like one of them was an open source version and one of them was not. And 
for like for downloading stuff, you need like a bunch of tiny servers um, right around. Well, okay, now we're getting into some controversial territory. Yeah, with I, file sharing and you know the Pirate Bay, all that stuff. Yeah, I forgot exactly what this was about. It, it might be, are you talking about? No, no, I'm talking about this startup. Like this is not. Oh, I'm okay. not talking about like torrenting. Um, okay. It was the the gist of it was that the open source com- startup won and is like in business now because. Um, they were able to tap into, like inherently open source means that there's a lot of people distributed around the world helping. And so they were able to win because the closed source were not able to have like their servers everywhere and be fast enough essentially. Um, it's not quite the decentralization point, um, which is like like the crypto stuff, but yeah, I I'm hazy on the details, but there's, my point is that there's open source use cases that exist. Cool. I want to kind of switch gears a little bit. And I got a bunch of questions on Instagram. I, I posted a story asking my followers <laughs> if they had any questions for you, Nang. So okay. I'm going to go through here and see if there are any good ones. Just kind of ad lib this. Um, this is interesting. When did he learn coding? Okay. The classic question. <laughs> you, want, you want me to answer that one? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I started like for real doing coding um, in ninth grade. My school had a CS class, so I started in ninth grade. That's fourteen years old. Okay, fourteen this guy, years old. This guy's literally just glazing you. He's like, <laughs> I mean, you have a master's CS CMU, worked at Quant, doing a startup right now, and you're so young. Okay, he, he literally just glazed. <laughs> that's not even a question. He's literally just glazing you. <laughs> All right, I'm just going right. <laughs> Okay, here's a really good one. Here's a really good one. So we talked about the progression of getting the job that pays, like, you know, the high paying job, big tech or quant. Here's an interesting question, which is, do you think programmers should target big tech companies for a job or go directly to the startup path? Or do what you did, which is try to get the big tech first and then transition. Okay, I think the optimal plan is... I mean, I don't mean to like toot my own horn, but I do think that I took a very optimal plan, which is you graduate, you do big tech for a year or two years, and then you go do your startup. I think that this, it depends on the personality and the the person, but I think that there's a couple factors on making people be able to do their best work. And one is like being able to not feel insecure about what you're doing like for the startup stuff right now i'm very like my judgment on decisions is not clouded because i don't need to prove anything like i already worked it and you know my i do care about what my parents think or whatever um and i try not to but as a normal person i think like most people somewhat care about what their parents think and or like what other people think and so so yeah, once you get like the big tech for like maybe two years, then you have like a sense of security and then you can really just do your best work on the startup without rushing to get as much money and just like ignoring all the other stuff and doing, making bad decisions. Yeah. And then also you learn a lot about how to write good code from a big tech company, um, I would say. <laughs> Some people might disagree. You can for sure, um, but we can circle back to that. I think okay. a bigger point here is that we were talking about earlier, like, the amount of money that you can make working at these companies is actually truly astounding. And you don't yeah. realize it until you're in that position. And again, two years is a good time frame because once you've been working for that period of time, you have a really solid cushion mm-hmm. financially, which is important because you have that yes. security underlying. It can be very hard to go work for a startup if you can't afford rent or because yeah. very often, if you don't have funding, for example, you're trying to get funding, you're not going to have any income. You're going to yeah. have zero income. How are you going to afford rent? How are you going to afford food? How are you going to afford travel? All these things, right? Yeah. And me healthcare. Me, exactly. How are you going to get healthcare, bro? You break your arm, what are you going to do? I saw a video the other day about of some guy walking around a, like this, I think, a, like a gap. Some guy was walking around a gas station with like a broken arm. Uh-huh. from like years ago and it was literally just like flopping around and i was like what the heck <laughs> i shared this with my friends i was like dude's like walking around with a broken arm literally just hanging there and his like trick is to like swing it around <laughs> like, i'm like what is what even happening fuck? here 
Yeah. Um, so you, hey, this guy, this guy's trolling you. That guy should should have moved to Canada and got yeah healthcare. Yeah, paying for like sixty percent taxes. Yeah, but Let's that that is also another thing of like security. Like me and Pan were not funded for three months. Yeah, and we had jobs before, so that allowed us to like actually not be worried. Like, of course we were worried. We also like did free trials with our own money, but that just allowed us to do our best work on pair so far, at least. This guy asks, Rodney asks, how can you compete with other AI code editor startups raising tens of millions? Yeah. What's the game plan? I actually want to know this too. (laughs) Yeah. So there's a couple factors, right? Like one is that we're open source. And I think that would actually pay off huge in the future. I think like the, if you think about the winning product in this space, I'm willing to bet that it should be open source. I think that's um, for a number of reasons because <clears throat> one, there's a lot of transparency issues when it comes to these code editors, especially for enterprise. You see the, the most popular one right now is VS Code. Over 73% of developers worldwide use it and it is open sourced. That's yeah. like a big reason why it's so useful. And so, in my mind, it just makes sense that the AI version of VS Code should be open source too. And then, you know, a lot of these code editors and their like team and stuff, I would say they don't understand like distribution in this space quite well. Um, recently, a lot of our competitors have been doing a lot better on that. But so it's, it's, a, it's a grind of a competition right now. But I do think that me and Pan have an edge Again, the unfair advantage thing yeah. of like distribution and marketing for this niche. Hopefully, we'll see. Akash asks, kind of in a similar vein, what's the long term vision on Pair AI? Would you say just leaning into the open source aspect? Yeah, it's open sourced uh, distribution. And the core of all of this is just to make the best AI code editor. Like, the UI right now is just version one. We think mm-hmm. that everything should be transformed. We want to make huge bets on how people code or how people develop. I don't think, yeah, I mean, coding development. Yeah, like whatever. you said, you're trying to get it to where people don't, there aren't coding at all. Exactly. So we want to make huge bets and maybe somewhat controversial decisions on how that gets done. And I think that is, if we make those decisions correctly, we will be the best AI code editor. And by the way, this is a sentiment that you share with Jensen Huang. Like he said something very similar. <laughs> Jensen um, Huang is the goat. He's so, the I mean, goat. you posted this, this reel the other week. Like, yes. All right. So is it true? Is it true that you are, you are part of the Huang dynasty? You're his, related to him? He's in the family tree? It is not true. However, I mean... With the Jensen Huang thing, it's been a long-standing inside joke within my community. So posting that, it was really funny to my community, but everybody else just thought it was real. Um, <laughs> I'm not I thought it was real. I was like, wait, what the, <laughs> the heck? I mean, I look like the guy a bit. But, um, but yeah, it's not entirely true, but I will say that I do have like family lore that runs kind of deep in, the same, in a similar vein that contributes to like my motivation when it comes to this kind of stuff. So family runs deep for you. Yeah. This is an interesting question. What are some physical and personality traits that you look for when meeting new people? And it kind of relates to like startup co-founders. When you're looking for to meet new people, Mm -hmm. what are these qualities and and aspects that you filter on to like say, okay, this person, I want to work with them. Or I think we could work well together, for example. Yeah, I think that I'm very picky with people I, tr- I work with. And the traits that I look for is one, always following what they say they'll do. Like if somebody is always saying, I want to start a YouTube channel. If they don't start a YouTube channel, I'm, there's no chance I'm going to work with them. It's like, like, how can I trust them at that point? And I would say another thing is, do they love what they do? Will they do it for free? Not work for like me for free, but would they, if they had all the money in the world, would they still be doing the same thing? And I think that if I see that, that's just like, it's, it's huge. I think that then we will definitely work well together. And I, for me, those are two things I really pride myself on 
is that, uh, yeah, those two things. I think that's an important one because again, how we talked about the idea, but also you mentioned investors, they're not looking at fundamentally the idea. They're looking at the founders. The founders matter more than the idea because execution, when you have a startup, the execution is going to go all over the place. Like you're going to, you're going to be looping. You're going to be snaking around doing a train, U-turns, loopholes, like all this stuff. So, I mean, kind of touching on personal advice, the way I invest, I don't even really look at a company and their financials. Obviously I do to a degree, but I really put my money behind who's at the, who's at the, the head of the ship. Mm -hmm. Who's steering it, right? Yeah. And I use that to for inform my investments, for example. Do you invest in NVIDIA? I have some NVIDIA, yes. Okay. I think the bigger bet for me was was Tesla back in the day. Yeah. I've been a Tesla shareholder since 2017, and I have Go never dude. sold. So. Go, dude. Yeah. Ben's Basically. <laughs> not really. I mean, I haven't, I'm not going to sell it, obviously. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so it's kind of like a piece of advice. But in the same vein, people, when they're looking to meet other high quality individuals, how would you recommend people go about doing that? Um, like in college, for example, because I feel like this is, you know, the primary demographic is college age students. So if you were transported back to college, what would you do to meet other people who are like-minded? Yeah, I think that for this, it stems from who you are. If you are somebody that you would work with, you will attract these people into like that would want to work with you. It's like if you don't, if you're always saying that you want to do something and you never do it, if you don't like what you're doing, if you're like, I don't know, not uh, like dedicated, dedicated or like serious about some of this stuff, and you, like if you wouldn't even want to work with yourself, then I think that's like step one fail, right? Because you might find someone that you want to work with. They're not going to want to work with you. So you, like that is already um, the problem. And then in college, finding people that um, you would want to work with, I actually think it comes back to yourself. Because if you're the type of person that loves robotics and you want to find a robotics co-founder, you will be in robotics club and you will find them. Like they will be there around you. And so, and if you're not, if you're like, um, not interested in, in all this stuff and you're just like in your college dorm room and like, yeah, you just want to be a, like, won't be around those people that you want to meet. So, um, yeah, I think maybe if I had more helpful advice, it would also just be, be friendly, like expect nothing in return. Like you can help someone with their homework and expect nothing in return. I will say for in college, like at CMU, I was self-proclaimed good at what I was doing. And for example, one day I forgot my study guide. For these tests, you can bring in a one page study guide. It has all your like cash offsets, um, your cheat like, sheet. reference sheet. Yeah, cheat sheet. <laughs> and so- Bro said cash. <laughs> no, no, like on the sheet, you would have like your oh, cash okay, offsets. Okay, yeah, so. you're just a fat <laughs> cheat sheet. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, so basically I forgot one one time. And without it, you're cooked. You're absolutely cooked. And so, I got cooked on one test. I was like, damn, like, I don't want other people to feel like this. So then for the next remaining test, I'm, I made my cheat sheet and I also printed out multiple copies of this pre That's cheat That's so sheet. big brain. And I put it- That's well, mega. I don't even know if you, you know where I'm going with this. I, Okay, let's hear it, let's hear it. <laughs> okay, maybe. <laughs> but I would put it outside of the test room for anybody that forgot. And then nobody, and like people used it. And then people would come up to me and be like, yo, this is like, this is goaded. And because of that, people that were also, I considered to be goaded, wanted to talk to me more. And then we just became good friends from that. So That's yeah. actually goaded, bro. That is like some <laughs> mega big brain IQ, hyper IQ, infinite IQ moment. <laughs> Thanks, I would, I would love you personally, because that, that, if I were in that position, that's like literally lifesaver. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the amount of fear at that point, it's like your entire world is like it's collapsing. Test. And yeah, I was like tweaking it the fuck out. I was crashing. I was like, yeah. I took the test. I didn't know any of the offsets. I was like, yeah, nobody should feel it's like over. this. It's over. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I actually want to circle back something, which is you mentioned that number one, my advice for people who are trying to meet others, other like-minded individuals. So my advice for people who are trying to meet other like-minded, can yeah. I even get this right? My <laughs> advice for people who are trying to meet other like-minded individuals in college is very simple. 
Step one is you need to leave your apartment. Mm. Yes. Right? Especially in computer science, people, they're, st they're inside all day coding. And we mentioned how we do that now, potentially, but our lives now, post-grad, are very different pre-grad, right? Like the mentality and the mindset and the execution, the action, the day-to-day -day is very, very different. And your priorities when you're in college should be number one. Number one priority in college is actually to meet people because yeah. that is the nexus of your social activity as a human. It isn't going to happen in college. Like you're not going to get that much activity where you can just pop into random people. Like you live in a dorm. You can literally take one foot out of your door, see somebody, talk to them. When you live in an apartment, bro, I don't even know my neighbors. I don't know anybody on the different floors pretty much. Yeah. It's very sequestered. It's very segmented, diverted. People are in their own bubbles. They do their own thing. And they're very much, they have their stuff that they need to take care of. And they're very trapped in that routine. So they can't really extend outside of that. So it's very, uh, that was a super long-winded answer of saying, you just need to go meet people, right? So that's step one. And then step two, I call it the law of attraction. Just do the things that you actually enjoy and you're going to meet people who are also doing those things. Yeah. And they're very much like you in a sense. And this is the one of the things that I, like, if you're trying to be somebody that you're not, you're going to be in the wrong room because you're going to meet the wrong people because they're not doing the things that they want to do. Or maybe they are actually, no, they're doing the things that they want to do, but you're not. So then you're just in there with the wrong people. Exactly. Yeah. When I was in college, I used to meet people, like my closest friends came from the gym. Mm -hmm. The gym was the nexus of how I met people. And I met a lot of hardworking, really smart, disciplined people at the gym because guess what? They had good physiques. I had a good physique. We saw each other lifting some, you know, some respectable weight. We're like, all right, this guy, you know, he's, he's respect. <laughs> That's respect right there. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because one of my best friends from college, we actually met like I was part of my school's investments committee, actually. I mentioned Dang. how I like I did investing. So I was the tech sector head. At, actually, I wasn't the tech sector head at the time, but this is kind of a rant. Uh, we basically, Georgia Tech, they had Bloomberg terminals. Okay. Like this public area where you go, you sit at Bloomberg terminal, and you can research companies, like all the information about Bloomberg terminals cost like $20,000 a year subscription, by the way. Yeah. So I, I went to the Bloomberg terminal. There was a guy sitting at one. There was another one next to him open. So I go sit at the open one. And this guy, is, he's like, he looks like he's sweating out of his mind. Like he's, he's, he's like, it's like midnight. He's like sweating out of his mind, like stressing on something. And I just like say, yo, like, what's up, bro? Like you having a hard time? Like what's going on? Yeah. And we just chatted a bit. And then a couple of weeks later, I see this guy at the gym. And he actually comes up to me. And he's like, yo, bro, I didn't know you were like huge like that. Because I was like repping like... I mean, at the time I was like repping 135 on shoulder press, which I guess is impressive. And so he was like, bro, I didn't know you were like built like that. Um, and so then we, the relationship developed from there. But the idea is if you're doing the things that you actually enjoy, you're going to cross paths with people who are also doing those things. Yep. And the more concentric circles that you guys have in common, guess what? The more similar you are. And that's basically the law of attraction is like, don't go out of your way to do things and be a person who you're not. Because ultimately, you're just going to be surrounded by the wrong people who you don't actually connect with. I could not have said it better. Very true. Yeah. And we actually yeah, bonded that's an, because that's we went one. to the gym together. And yeah, yeah, so yeah. there you go. And that's another yeah. thing is like this whole social media thing is, is interesting. But most of the people that I've met up with, like we go to the gym. That's like the, the, the shared activity. Yeah. It's like you go to the gym, you hit a lift with somebody. It's like that's a brotherhood. You're connected. Yeah. Exactly. By the way, this guy's strong. I, I, I forgot to mention. <laughs> oh yeah. shit! Thanks, man. Yeah, this yeah. guy was repping my one one rep max. And was just <laughs> like, yeah, this is too easy. Nah, <laughs> not even close. Um, yeah, I think uh, what you said about the like you meet your friends or the people in college is the most important. A hundred percent. You forget a lot of what you read on a textbook, but you never forget. Or like, I guess what lasts longer is your relationships with your friends, like who you're reading. The textbook with is very important yeah like when you're pulling that all-nighter who's yeah. sitting next to you exactly those yeah. those are the brotherhoods those are the bonds that you make for life i agree yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. those are those, those are crazy times. crazy bonds anyways yeah. can never forget those yeah <laughs> i think i think that's a good uh kind of segue into wrapping this episode up okay do you want me to talk about the family stuff because i feel like that's 
adds a lot of um, like explanation to, to some of the stuff. Also, I don't want people to just think I'm, I'm baiting too hard with the Jensen Huang thing. There's a reason why. Go ahead. Let's, let's dive into it. Let's dive oh, okay. Into it. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, so essentially, a big part of my life mission is my family lore. And I've told Ben about this um, already, but I'll just maybe we'll talk about it again. And yeah, so once upon a time, my great grandfather was Forbes level rich in Singapore. Like he was the baller. And then he gave birth to my grandpa, who was also very, very rich. And there's a lot of, it's a big family because they did family business. And so my grandpa was super rich. And then he had my dad. Okay, my dad grew up also very wealthy. Like he had private driver to school, everything. Like, um, bro was crazy Asian, right? If crazy have, rich Asian. What was it? Crazy rich Asians. If you have seen Crazy Rich Asians, that was my dad's childhood, and <laughs> it, it was crazy. And yeah, and he also had like there's one scene with a flower opening up. Like my grandma would have that flower every year and make my dad watch it, and so that was how my dad grew up. And then when, right before I was born, long story short, my grandpa fell off and we did not have any more money. And we moved to the US and yeah, like then I was born. And so I didn't know what was going on because I, you know, I did not grow up rich and my parents did not tell me any of this until I grew up. So I grew up pretty normal in the US. And the, until I was about like five or something, Essentially, after that, I went back to Singapore a few times. I kind of got a sense of what was going on because um, when I go back to Singapore, even now, I see my relatives and they are living like a super nice life, pretty much like crazy rich Asians. Um, and they are still up, like all the, my grandpa's relatives are still up. And so just seeing that makes me, I, I've seen how nice, how, I've seen how nice life can be. And every time I come back to the U.S., it's like, I feel like it's not mine at all. Right. With your 300K <laughs> quant job. Okay, this is before 300K <laughs> quant job. But I'm, I'm telling you, like, that, their life is like, like, okay, short segue, like, $0 to 100K is like a huge step up. 100K to 200K is like also a huge step up. Anything past that, your life doesn't change. Until you hit like a million, five million, then you become like... I don't know. Your life probably changes a bit. I don't know if you would agree. This is what I think for me at least. Like two hundred to three hundred k is like I can buy furniture now. So okay, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I don't know what kind of furniture I you're mean, buying. Furniture's expensive, man. So <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, how about five hundred to six hundred? After I would say three hundred, that's when it's like, yeah, you're really tapping. You're really tapping three hundred. I would say. Yeah, my point is that I would be really happy with the three hundred, but then I've seen like yeah. the. Crazy rich Asians life. Also, if you want to have your own family one day, yeah. sure, 300 is enough for me, but what about my future wife, my future kids? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's expensive. I, I can't, <laughs> I would not want, like, people talk about cost of living crisis in America. It's true. Like, I would not, I don't think I would be able to support a family mm -hmm. given my current income, even though it's, you know, top 1%. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, just continuing on the, on the story. My sorry, yeah, <laughs> completely off. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> what else? <laughs> what I was saying is that, um, yeah, so so buying my parents a house and stuff, it's like my parents pretty much, or my I guess my yeah, both my parents had that lifestyle and now they lost it all, and so their lives changed. It went from like super nice, and like my dad didn't grow up super nice, so I guess, um. It was a huge shift for him, but he's he's a trooper. Like my dad is is goaded, honestly. Like he he built it up a bit so that I could go to college and stuff. My point is that now part of my life dream after seeing the Singapore life and coming back and not feeling like it's mine is that my dream is to restore my family branch and give my mom everything that she had before. Bro's putting his bloodline on his back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some some could say Giga that. Chad, get Chad right here. <laughs> Yeah, my 1% of the way, less than 1%. Future posterity, they're going to thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, so so that's that's part of it. Um, that's also like the Jensen Huang meme because Jensen Huang is hella rich and my relatives are hella rich, but it's it's not mine at all. Like, You can't, yeah. you can't access that. 
Yeah. I don't think I, I don't think it's not like I can't. It's yeah. that it would just, it just wouldn't make sense. Like they would, I don't know. It would just be a bit weird. Um, maybe, maybe it would upset my, my parents and my grandma and stuff. I don't know. It's the point you is I'm not yourself. going to. You had the 300k yeah. job. Like yeah. it's not enough. You need to do it more for yourself. Yeah. That yeah. and also I can't. <clears throat> is it recording? Yeah, yeah, it's recording. <laughs> okay. We just ran out of battery again. <laughs> yeah. I have three batteries. We're on the third battery. Yeah. Mid yeah, I got cut off. Yeah. But what I was saying is that's yeah, I just I can't. I'm gonna buy another camera right after this. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> yeah. If I could, yeah. who knows if I would. I don't know if it's like a whole like like with all this stuff, I'm not very dramatic just in life. I would say for all like things in life, I'm pretty nonchalant by nature. And so who knows? But what I'm saying is who knows if I would take money if they like, like we want to help you. That is a, a yeah. big thing. Yeah. yeah. But there's also another thing is like the whole self earner um, mentality is like, I only can get to what I want um, by, myself. by myself. And I actually think that's, that's a bit flawed um, because if, if my goal is to, or if, I'll say if someone's goal is to have innovation in the world, they should optimize for that. And if they can, use something that a positive the, externality yes why not use it exactly yes to a certain degree and then um yeah that'll be good so i agree completely like you if go. you have yeah. access to these positive externalities right basically a cash injection yeah why wouldn't you use it yeah exactly again unfair advantage what unfair advantage do you have lean into it exactly the only problem is that I do not have that unfair advantage right now, so I can't yet. get money. Not yet. Not yet. So maybe if, maybe if, um, maybe, yeah, later down the road. Are you? Can you talk about the YC specifics? Yeah, it's it's all public. I can talk about okay. it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, how much? Okay. Yeah, they give us 500k uh, total. The first 125k is for seven percent of the company, and the last, uh, I guess, 125, and then the next. 375k is a percentage of the valuation of your company at the next round. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you have like 375, or I guess 3,075, 3,750. Let's just say you raise yeah. another million dollars next round. Yeah, then you have a per that percentage. They get a percent of whatever percent you were raising for. Yeah. 375 divided by probably like, I don't know, 1,000, right? Because it's yeah. divided. So like 37.5% of whatever that round would be raised for. Correct. Yeah. 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 In simple <laughs> terms, trying to get people to understand. So, I mean, yeah, yeah 500K, it's a pretty good runway. Yeah, 500K is a pretty good runway. I think that... And also the YC name, like it just gives some cash, cachet. <laughs> yeah, YC is, is like, is really good. I'm surprised that there's, there's not another version like a huge competitor to yc like there's a lot of other incubators but yc is the only one with the same amount of like clouts so to speak and so my is, is sam altman he's the yeah he owns it? guy oh sam altman's he, he was working at yc yeah yeah he he's no longer a partner i think because he's too busy but he's a big part of it yeah yeah so my goal at like 60 if i'm super successful is to make Another version of YC because I think that there's enough talented people that can't get into YC that would probably, or maybe not like can't, like just circumstances for some reason, they didn't get into YC. They could probably benefit from a equally as good, if not better competitor. If you want to do it with me when we're 60. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously we don't know what's going to, people aren't <laughs> going to be writing code then. So we don't even True. need YC, bro. People are just going to be doing Crayolas. You know, the etch and sketch. Yeah. That's I how people know. are going to make startups in like 2060. <laughs> you just have an etch -it yeah. sketch. You just do it. Boom. AI takes it over. Whole company's built like etch -it sketch. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. All right, man. I think okay. that was good. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. And I hope everybody at home enjoyed. Hell yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, I'll say big plug from my end on trypair.ai. That's our website. Please try it out. Like I'm... Honestly, very, very proud of what we've made so far, and we're just gonna keep going. So if you want to use the best AI code editor out there, and also you can contribute to it as well, just check out 
just check out Pear AI. Yeah, everybody try Pear AI. I'm going to leave a link to that and also Nang's socials in the comments so you can check that out as well. Okay, yeah. sounds good. Yeah. Peace.